Okay, uh, Ramon is visiting us from the National Cancer Institute of the Netherlands, and I'll turn it over to you. So, uh, thank you. Um, oh, we still don't have it on the screen. Uh, to plug it in. Sorry. <laughs> Details. So it's number two. Here we go. Was there, wasn't there? Power on too. <laughs> All right, so uh, well, basically, I got involved in uh, Transmart through a project that we run in the Netherlands called Trade. And I could end up with a final slide with more than 100 names, but instead I will actually name a few names right in the beginning. Um, and that is in particular Gerrit Meijer, who is the PI of the trade project. He's also actually the PI, the, the head of the colorectal cancer research group that I'm working in. Jeroen Balian, the CTO of trade. Jan Willem Boyten, the project manager. And then there's a few people who are instrumental to help the user perspective Sanne Abel, bioinformatician, and Mariska Bierkens, a power user and an important person in the data team. That leaves me as being a simple molecular biologist, just trying to do some translational research. And um, well, we study colorectal cancer. So, um, well, as known, colorectal cancer is an uh, important disease with approximately 1 million new cases each year. It's the second most common cause of cancer death in the Western world. And importantly, there is an inverse relationship between the stage of diagnosis and survival. So early diagnosis, high chance of five-year survival, late diagnosis, uh, small chance of five-year survival. Now we work in the Department of Pathology. So uh, my colleagues like to look at these H&E stained sections. And basically what you're seeing from left to right is normal tissue, benign tissue, malignant cancer, and metastatic disease. As a molecular biologist, I'm also very much interested in the molecular changes that actually go along in case of colorectal cancer, activation of wind signaling pathway, then there's kicking in some genomic instability, and then there's more trouble ahead that leads to more malignant disease. So if we now try to put the clinical needs in the same schedule, again here, the black line here is the five-year survival curve. And now if you look here, you can see there's several needs that we need to address. One is early detection, so screening, and therefore we need better diagnostic biomarkers. We need to predict recurrence, because if someone is diagnosed with a primary disease and it's being removed by the surgeon, the question is, should this patient receive additional therapy or not. So who do you want to treat? So we need better prognostic biomarkers. Once you know that treatment is necessary, the next question becomes, uh, how should you treat the patient? And therefore we need better predictive biomarkers. And during treatment, you want to monitor intervention response for which we need better disease monitoring biomarkers. So summarized, we'd like to make use of these molecular alterations to understand tumor biology and to have a better understanding of the clinical behavior. And in this way, look for different biomarkers to cover the different clinical needs. So what we are doing in our research group, the Translational Gastrointestinal Oncology Group, is uh, well, simple, isn't it? It's just collecting clinical information, collecting tumor tissue, blood samples, stool samples. We probably have the most expensive collection of shit in Europe. Um, and we have preclinical models that we study, for instance, organoids, and then we do some magic in the lab, DNA, RNA, protein profiling. Um, so far, nothing really special, I would say. However, what is important is that we really 
aim to translate our molecular findings into clinical tests. So that's basically here represented by this blue arrow. And there's another way to show it, and that's like this. So this is the well-known, um, well, valley of death. So on the one hand, there's the research that we are doing. On the other hand, there's the aim to improve healthcare, but somehow in between things go terribly wrong. And to get a better understanding of these steps in between, here you have a view on the translational research pipeline. So on the top left, you see the biomarker identification part. And at the end, the ultimate goal to come up with biomarker tests that can be used in the clinic. And in between, there is something that we call bench to bedside to bench. And here you see that there's a lot of steps that we need to take. So for instance, we need to work hard on biomarker validation, which require all these biobanks and laboratory quality systems. We need to work towards assay development, which uh, preferably one does in collaboration with private partners, because then you have the best chances to end up with clinical tests. You need to perform prospective validations for which you have to build large consortia and networks. You need to convince yourself and the government and the insurance agencies that what you're doing is actually cost effective. So you need to be able to do health technology assessments. And in many cases, you will need to run clinical trials. And then we are not discussing tens of patients, but rather thousands to many thousands. So if you think about this setting where you have a multi-center joint academic and private translational research consortium, then what you really need is a sustainable IT platform for querying, viewing, and analyzing the data. And so when we were at the point that we wanted to find such a IT infrastructure, we did not really find a solution that suited our purposes. And so what do you do then? Then basically you initiate another IT project, right? So we initiated TRADE. Um, we were funded by CTMM, the Center for Translation and Molecular Medicine, who was funding 300 million euros of translational research projects overall in the Netherlands. And all of these projects had the same problem. So CTMM funded TRADE to say, okay, try to solve your IT infrastructure. So the CTMM trade project developed and implements a long-lasting IT infrastructure for translational research. And we are facilitating the collection, storage, analysis, and archiving of data generated in biomedical research projects. So um, how are we doing that? Why, why would trade actually uh, achieve its goals in a time that there is very much criticism on IT projects because there are so many examples of projects that fail. So first of all, we aimed for a process-oriented approach. And what I mean by that is that we really looked at the process. So we know that uh, patients or participants enter the clinic. There's all kinds of different procedures. Uh, there will be questionnaires ending up in electronic health records. There will be imaging, like clinical imaging, CT scans, MRI, PET imaging, but also in the pathology department, digital pathology slides. Samples are being collected, so tissue samples, stool, blood samples that need to be stored in biobanks. And then I like to squeeze some DNA, RNA, or protein from these samples and do some molecular profiling in the lab. Most importantly, somehow you need to bring these data together and you'd like to combine these data with existing databases, so external data that is around. You do some downstream analysis, and then you end up with scientific output, intellectual property. Most importantly, you really want to achieve improved healthcare. And in addition, and in particular after listening yesterday to e-patient David, you want to involve the patients. <laughs> So um, another aspect that we choose to do is that we should avoid reinventing wheels. What does that mean? It basically means that we were allergic to development and that we really try to adopt existing solutions. 
So we looked around for all of the steps that we needed. And this is the tools that in this case, the trade project has adopted. So in the clinical domain, that's Open Clinica. In the clinical imaging domain, it's NBIA and ICSNAT. Digital pathology, it's TAPIS. And then in the experimental domain, there's the phenotype database and Galaxy. Critically, of course, is the selection of the tool for data integration. And this is where we selected Transport. Um, maybe an additional remark. So the selection of the tools on the one hand is quite important because, of course, you want to work with those tools for quite a while. But in fact, it's even more important that you uh, really deal very well with the data. So in the end, there's the, the buzzword of fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data. And I think that uh, projects like these actually help to work towards fair data so that once you have your data organized well, you can actually move them from one tool to another. And in the end, you're not dependent on one particular tool. Um, so um, another feature of trade is that uh, there is a user-driven priority setting. And I guess that's exactly why I am here, because I'm not an IT person. I'm actually a user. So I was put in place as one of those users who should determine the priority setting. So if we look at translational research, it represents the scheme you see here. There's the patient, there's clinical information, there's disease biology information, and it's my job trying to integrate this to work towards improved outcome. Now that simple set, um, it's not easily done. So what we need is a kind of a holy grail, right? That actually makes this possible. And what we got was Transmart. So let's see how that works out. So from my perspective, the Transmart Research Workspace provides a data warehouse for final, so for the processed data. It allows to integrate clinical imaging biobanking and experimental data. It allows to, allows to query and view the data as well as the metadata. Um, it allows you to do some analysis. And actually the kind of analysis that I would like to do is that I have a study in Transmart. I'm in a meeting and somebody tells me, you have to look at the BRF wild type population and then this and this marker really shows a beautiful difference. I wanna be able to do that analysis on the spot based on my own uh, data that I have in Transmart. Transmart allows to export data or subsets of data, and then you can go back to your raw data and do specific analysis. So tracing back to the original, the raw data, and the steps that one took to make those data, turn them into processed data uh, before entry in Transmart is important. And it can connect to tools such as R and Galaxy. It's open source, it's free. Um, and importantly, there is an active international community, the Transmart Foundation, and today there's very many of these uh, people from the Transmart Foundation around. Annual meetings are organized, um, and I think what is another important feature is that is there, if you encounter unmet needs, and basically if you have resources, use those resources to fill Transmart functionality gaps. So what Trade has been doing in the past years is actually to provide financial support to do develop some new features into Transmart, in particular those features that were needed for the typical translational research projects that we were running. The brief commercial break is that you actually should come to the annual meeting. So mark the dates, October 25 to 27, it will be in San Diego. So um, an example from our studies on uh, colorectal cancer, in, in one of these studies, I uh, had the question that I wanted to look for prognostic biomarkers for patients who underwent resection of liver metastasis. Now in the Netherlands, there's this pathology database. So you can just query as a pathologist and ask, where can I find patients who underwent resection for liver metastasis? And then the answer is a number of hospitals, and okay, from there it becomes again hard labor. You have to travel to these hospitals. Of course, that's not far away in the Netherlands. That's really all nearby. 
Um, but the hard work is actually that you then need to collect this patient information. And this was really a lot of effort to do this for 350, you know, for uh, more than 500 patients. So we collected information, uh, well, general information about each of the patients, about the primary tumor, the liver metastasis, the kind of therapy that the patient received, and all the follow-up information. Next, you collect the uh, paraffin blocks with the tissue from the liver resections. And therefore, uh, from that, we were able to make tissue microarrays. So that's just punching little cores out of the uh, original block and putting them back into a new paraffin block. And then you can do these nice stainings again with hematoxyl and eosin, but also with your protein of interest. And if it's not so brown, there's little expression of the protein. And if it's more brown, there's a lot of expression of the protein. And then, of course, you can compare a little expression to a lot of expression and come up with survival curves and find out that, for instance, Aurora kinase A is a prognostic biomarker for this patient population. You do that for many markers, so you can have a lot of fun. And uh, you want to, well, and then basically this is the type of data that you've been collecting. So um, the patient information in the trade tooling, we have been storing this in Open Clinica. The uh, tissue microarrays were scanned for digital pathology and they're stored in TAPIS. And then the calls that belong to these uh, tissue microarrays, so uh, not so brown or very brown, is stored in the phenotype database. And from there, this information has been entered in Transmart. And at the same time, once you open Transmart, it allows you to get back to the original source data. So here you see the example when you open Transmart. Here is all these immunohistochemical markers that we have been looking at. You can now easily generate some survival curves. You can link back to the tissue microarray cores in TAPIS, and you can look at the scores for them linking back to the phenotype database. So putting Transmart and all the other tools in the scheme, this is kind of the connections that in this project were made. Now, um, yesterday there was a symposium on uh, precision medicine, and I guess that Barack Obama has the urgent question whether Transmart is actually able to store next-gen sequencing data. Uh, the answer is, of course, yes, we can. So uh, here you see some examples of uh, array CGH data, of uh, RNA-seq data, etc. cetera. Um, playing around with these omics data, uh, we want to treat omics data as they, uh, if they were from real patients, but getting there, we actually uh, composed a cell line use case. So basically, we took a bunch of cell lines and we gathered all kinds of uh, data types from there. So that's uh, DNA-seq, RNA-seq, uh, DNA arrays, RNA arrays, and mass spectrometry-based proteomics. So actually, we have a nice set of data to test uh, Transmart in all of its properties. Now, if you generate a lot of next-gen sequencing data, you have to think about the location where to store the raw data. I mean, the raw data are not going into Transmart. They have to go somewhere else. And so one solution to look at is actually the European Genome Phenome Archive, EGA. So together with Elixir, we have this EGA trade pilot project. And what basically the goal is here that if you do your queries in Transmart, and you come up with a subset of patients that are actually interesting for a next question. And if your bioinformatician has this new algorithm to actually say, oh, finally, we can find structural variants. Let's run this algorithm on this subset of the patients. <laughs> and actually, from that subset, using Galaxy as a workflow tool, you can get easy access to the location where you have stored your raw data, extract them, do new analysis, and if you really come up with nice results, final process data, push them back to Transmart. So this is the pilot that we are running at the moment. Uh, for those, well, who's familiar actually with Galaxy? Ooh, that's a relief, great. So uh, Galaxy is a workflow tool, um, and it, uh, well, it, it houses uh, molecular profiling, computation pipelines, uh, it actually is simple enough for simple molecular biologists to use, and more importantly, it actually connects the different um, 
the different tools together with version control so that uh, in retrospect you can go back and know exactly how the analysis originally has been done. Um, last but not least, professional support and training. So um, Open Clinica was the most mature tool when we started the trade project. And for that reason, Open Clinica is a hat in terms of uptake by many of the users. So you see within the Netherlands actually a nice uptake of the number of studies and the number of users of Open Clinica. And this is the kind of curve that we would like to see for Transmart as well. Uh, it's, it's, an old, it's an old slide from till October last year, so it's, it's increasing now, but uh, we really need to work that the uptake of Transmart is becoming at least as good as it is for Open Clinica. So what are the problems we are facing? Well, um, I think as, a, uh, as an end user, I can put data in Excel, but I cannot put data in uh, Transmart. And that's not necessarily a problem, uh, but you do have to provide a solution to this. And our solution is actually the data team. And the data team is really instrumental. So if you look at this scheme, you can see me and my colleagues over here being data suppliers. And you can see here the word data consultant. And the nice thing is that data consultants are actually real human beings that you can talk to and they actually come to you and they start to discuss really what is your data? What data do you want to store in Transmart? Um, how can we continue from here? So then there's the steps of the data curation. The data loaders will enter the data into Transmart. The user will check the data. If it's not good, this will be iterative until everyone is satisfied and then you will have your data in a safe curated state and the data are deployed and actually are accessible to those people that you want to provide access to. So as long as you work in a consortium, then you can just decide that the consortium members have access. Um, another important feature for a uh, simple molecular biologist like me is actually the visualization. And, um, well, it's very difficult for me to get enthusiasm from my colleagues for IT tools in general. But one day, quite some years ago, during the second annual meeting from the Cancer Genome Atlas, I encountered C. Bioporter. And as I'm studying cancer biology, I came back, I showed the tool to my colleagues, they opened it, and they were using it right away. So apparently it's possible that there are tools that you open and that people feel immediately, here I can address some questions that I have and I can understand the graphs and the buttons that I see. So um, I think the, the BioPortal is a nice example of how it's actually really feasible to attract users. I could also have a story on the limitations of the BioPortal, but the key message is there's this point of immediate attracted uh, by users to, uh, yeah, to start using it. So here's the visualization analysis of cancer studies. There's interactive subset selection. It's a powerful integration of data types. It has been developed by Memorial Sloan Kettering, but by now I think many of the developers of CBioPortal are actually working in these surroundings. And I guess many of you are familiar with it. Who knows CBioPortal? That's less than I expected, okay. Um, so by now what we actually decided is if the data are made ready for Transmart, you might as well make them ready for CBIO portal right away. And we are really working towards the setting where it's possible that once data are in Transmart, you actually can also visualize them in CBIO portal. Last but not least, uh, one of the studies that I'm involved in now is a phase three clinical trial called Cairo 5. And what you see in this trial is, well, a lot of stuff ongoing, including collection of blood samples. The previous example that I showed you was not a longitudinal study, but the Cairo 5 study is a longitudinal study. And so it's important for me that uh, this study can be accommodated in uh, Transmart. So there is the need to accommodate longitudinal studies. So to summarize, summarize the points that I just raised, 
Um, I think it's important that uh, there's easy loading of study data, intuitive data querying, and the accommodation of longitudinal study data. Last slide, I mentioned not that I would put on hundreds of names, but I do put on a lot of partners. There's this huge amount of both academic and private partners and charities like the Dutch Cancer Foundation and the Heart Foundation that all uh, collaborate on the trade project. I will mention one company because yesterday I learned that if a company takes itself serious, it has a, um, um, an office here in the Boston area, right? So the Hive is the company that has been doing most of the development uh, on Transmart and the person working now here at the moment is Wart Wijster from Dive. I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes, more or less, more or less. <laughs> you want to you want to add to the status of that work? The relationship between and trade? Oh, um, so the Etrix project has adopted Transmart, the trade project has adopted Transmart, and trade and Etrix are frequently uh, communicating with each other. For example, uh, so in, for this, we know quite well what kind of developments are done based on the finances that Etrix makes available and based on the finances that trade makes available. So these efforts are nicely complementary. Just to name one thing, uh, we are pushing more towards trying to use CBioPortal, while in Edrix, Smart R has been uh, generated. And I think these are completely different, but very nice complementary visualization tools that will make end users like me very happy. All right, great, thank you, very nice. Thanks. <laughs> This, I do. About that. When it works, it's great. <laughs> Not supposed to be a miracle, but. <laughs> okay.